recent years, Europe has experienced an enormous influx of immigrants. Most have been Muslim and male. Ayan Hirsi Ali describes the effect on European women in her new book, and the title conveys her argument, Pray. To discuss the book, Ayan Hirsi Ali and two of her friends, the journalist Christopher Caldwell and the scholar Valerie Hudson. Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Ayan Hirsi Ali grew up in Africa in the Middle East. She sought asylum in the Netherlands, becoming a citizen and serving in the Dutch parliament before moving to the United States. Ayan Hirsi Ali became an American citizen in 2013. She is now a fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Her new book, once again, Pray, Immigration, Islam, and the Erosion of Women's Rights. A fellow at the Claremont Institute, Christopher Caldwell publishes in a number of publications, including the New York Times. His books include Reflections on the Revolution in Europe, published in 2009, and The Age of Entitlement, America Since the 60s, published just last year. A professor of political science at the Bush School at Texas A&M, Valerie Hudson writes often on foreign policy and women's rights. Her best known work may be the 2004 book, Bear Branches, in which she examined the implications of China's demographic policies. In 2017, she published the influential article, In Plain Sight, The Neglected Linkage Between Bribe Price and Violent Conflict. Ayan, Chris, Valerie, welcome. All right, what happened? I'll, let me quote from or, or, or so, some statistics from Prey. Almost 3 million people have arrived illegally in Europe since 2009, close to 2 million in 2015 alone. A majority have come from Muslim majority countries, two thirds are male, and 80% of asylum applicants are under the age of 35. An enormous wave of immigrants to Europe who are young, Muslim, and male. What happened, Ayan? What caused this? Um, I would say three things caused this. Um, the first is the European political and other elite leadership who have failed in developing a sensible immigration policy. That's number one. Number two, I also say that the same group of leaders, and this is over decades, um, have failed to understand Islam as a religion, as a culture, and as a neighboring civilization. And then finally, this is having an impact and uh, an unintended negative consequence in the streets of Europe. And this book uh, illuminates that third piece is um, the impact that it's having, I zoom in on women. Women are facing an increased violence, sexual violence in the public place. And, um, it, but it's not only limited to women, uh, Jewish minorities, homosexuals, uh, members of Muslim communities who uh, opt to be assimilated into European values are all facing problems. But it is these three. I think at the core of it, it is um, a failure of leadership uh, of uh, European leaders and a betrayal of the institutions uh, that they are supposed to lead. Another handful of statistics from Prey. France, a 17% increase in rapes from 2017 to 2018. Germany, victims of rape and sexual coercion rose by 41% in 2017. Sweden, a 12% increase in reported sex offenses in 2016. England and Wales, again, a sharp increase in sexual crimes. Young Muslim males arrive and sex crimes increase. Valerie, why? Um, what I'd like to point out is, is that even if we struck the adjective Muslim from that, uh, my own research has shown is that when the sex ratio of the society becomes highly masculinized, and that could be through immigration, because the first wave of migrants is almost always young, young adult men, but it could also be through sex ratio alteration, such as we see in China. 
Uh, and so even in China and in India, with also highly masculinized uh, sex ratios, we have seen growth in violent crime, but especially in sex crime. Uh, but I think Ion's argument is that uh, coming from uh, societies where, where women are seen as fair game actually can exacerbate this tendency. Uh, sex differences are real and it matters if two thirds of the migrants coming uh, to your country are uh, unaccompanied young adult males. Well, so Chris, come in here at any, anytime you'd like, but Ayan has, here's a quotation again from Prey. You've raised this point just now, Valerie. Mm -hmm. And Ayan herself writes, why does this book focus only on Muslim men and not on all men when sexual violence and contempt for women are universal phenomena? So what, I, I don't know if it's possible to tease this out, but I'm almost thinking in kind of terms of proportions. What proportion of the problem that appears now in Europe is because men are men and mm -hmm. what proportion because they're Muslim men, Chris? Well, there is a there is a context um, to all of this, which is the evolution of of Western uh, society, and um, you know the inc increase in reported um, rape I, I, and, and 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 sexual offenses. I don't I don't doubt the reality of it, but a part of it is um, a part of it is the increased sensitivity and the increased. Um, awareness let's let's call it without entering the argument of 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 western elites i remember about five years ago um the washington post um tried to do a a survey of 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 sexual assault on campus um uh in in around the time of the duke lacrosse hoax we now know but but um that was what a decade ago i seem to yes um, let's say a decade ago i'm sorry um, and they discovered that the, the biggest problem campus was Brown, Brown University in, in, in Rhode Island, which I think led, was not what they were looking for. And it led them to believe that, that actually this was as much a phenomenon of, of reporting as it was of actual, actual incidents. There's no doubt that, 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 that there's something changing in the, in, 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 in Europe's youth. And, and, and I think Valerie makes a good, very good point about just the anthropological difference between predominantly male societies and predominantly female societies. But a lot depends on the cultural context in which those imbalanced societies arise. So for instance, you know, you can have the, you know, the sort of like platoon marauding through through Vietnam, which is one sort of hyper male society. On the other hand, if you look at the places where female suffrage arose in the early 20th century, the first place it happened was in the American West. And, 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 and part of the reason is that these societies were heavily male and it was something, uh, let's just say that the men were, were were uh, women were in short supply, they were in high demand, they were in, a, in sort of in control of the society just by their very, by their very rareness. And, and um, so this happening in a, in a sort of like an ordered, sort of stable Western society can actually produce fruits for women. Okay, Ayan, I, I have to confess, I wasn't expecting this. The gate opens. And Chris and Valerie come out, and there are some problems with your fundamental thesis here. Valerie says, uh, Valerie may not let me get away with this, but I'm going to try to put this in. No, I, I won't most, let you get away with the that. The most yeah, yeah. way I can, yeah. because I, I, want, I, I have a feeling Ayan will be able to handle herself. <laughs> Valerie says, wait a minute, it's not Muslim men necessarily, it's men. Mm -hmm. And Chris says, wait a minute, all right, all right probably there is some extra or additional, there's something real taking place. But part of what's going on is that we live in a time when European societies, the welfare state, uh, the, the, everyone is cautious and sensitized and they're going to report, report activity, report crimes in a way that they didn't before. So it's not Muslim men creating violence, it's men who are a problem as men and by the way, it may not be as much violence as it looks like anyway. 
and I answered. Well, I, I, I would like to hear your time. <laughs> <Yeah, back. I, laughs> Come on in, Valerie. Okay. That, yes, the men part does absolutely matter. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I think Ayan makes a very persuasive argument that uh, these men are coming from cultures in which women uh, are seen as prey. Uh, she mentions the traditions of modesty, of uh, honor and honor killings, uh, and the norm of gender segregation. These kinds of things cannot be said, for example, of China. Uh, and so while we have seen an increase in rapes in China because of the sex ratio alteration, I think what you're seeing in, in uh, Europe is that trend being exacerbated by uh, the cultural context from which these young men uh, come. Uh, so I <laughs> yes, and I, I, if, if I may say, Peter, I, 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 I don't rising to her yeah. defense. I no, 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 I'm rising to my own defense. I, I just want to say, if I raise, if I raise Europe, um, it's not because I deny the reality of of the, that Ayanna is describing in the in the Muslim world. It's because it sort of takes two to tango. Okay, I would I would describe one incident. Let's say if there has been one incident in um, in European. Muslim relations Come over on. the last decade that stood out above all others. And, and remember, this has been, an, it been a time of mass migration. It's been a time of, of some pretty serious acts of terrorism, above all in Paris. The one incident that I think still sticks in all Europeans' minds is the mass sexual assault in Cologne on New Year's Eve of 2015 to 2016. It's a very serious thing. I trust Ayan to talk about about that today. But what I insist on is that the European react, the European context of that, and the European reaction to it is a very important part of this problem. Yeah. Ayan, you'd pick up the pieces of the mess I've just made. <laughs> so, Peter, uh, let me put it out there. I consulted with Valerie and with Christopher during the process of writing this book. And I needed, uh, and I think it added a great deal of value to the book to acknowledge uh, exactly what Valerie said, which is uh, there is the male part of the story, young men in any given context, um, and then in large numbers who uh, to engage in sexual misconduct. And then what Christopher says is also correct. Um, and so having and thank you both and i don't think i don't think that uh, there is a contradiction it's just um when christopher says look there is a context there is an evolution in the western uh be it america or europe there is an evolution the relationship between men and women i want to make it even more explicit and say um, and I think I'll get into trouble for this, but I'm used to it. I think that it is a given in Western society that the general society um, condemns sexual violence against women, not just in the law books, but also in private when people are in their, uh, you know, behind closed doors in their homes they still condemn sexual violence. That then takes me to almost the mirror opposite of what's going on in the Arab Middle East, in South Asia, in parts of Africa, what we've come to call Muslim majority countries or Islamic civilization. Sexual violence against women is condemned, but there is a but and an if. Mm -hmm. uh, Valerie pointed to the modest Women are divided into good women and bad women. Good women behave according to the honor code and they have the protection of their male relatives. Females who find themselves out of that orbit where they're not considered modest and they have no male protection, they uh, put themselves at risk of what happened in Cologne. Uh, the rape game, it's called in North Africa and it's called Taharush. Uh, it happened to Lara Logan and I have Lara Logan's test detail in the book. So I think it is extremely important, and this is where the Europeans failed. Europeans have had a longer relationship with the Arab world, with 
the Middle East and with the Muslim world than America has. But at least um, since the 1960s or 70s, uh, they have been in denial about cultural aspects of the Muslim world that are completely different from cultural aspects in Europe. And I think it is, it's extremely important to say this, um, to understand it and to research it without having uh, to deal with the kind of demonization that all three of us, Valerie and Christopher, have all dealt with. And, and the, the more people like us are demonized, the more you have these dramatic... Um, I'm trying to be very, very careful. Because, <laughs> and the reason is I don't want to, uh, to present false cause and effect a cause and effect narrative here. Uh, the story of this book is that there is a correlation and there's a very strong correlation between the spikes in sexual violence that we're seeing and immigration from mostly Muslim majority countries. And that we need to follow up on this correlation, see exactly where it leads in order to develop sensible policy. Chris, Chris raised the incident in Cologne on New Year's Eve of which year again was it? Uh, New Year's Eve of 2015, which means New Year's Day of 2016. 2016. So. All right. So large numbers of German women and large numbers of recent immigrant young males, and there's just a kind of melee of sexual crimes. All right. By the way, I want to stipulate here that prey, although we're going at it as at least I enjoy that kind of conversation. But Prey is a meticulously researched book and very carefully argued. I just want to stipulate it full of statistics and incidents that illustrate points that are this is this is not this is not a polemic. This is a serious work of 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 sociology. All right. And can I point out Yes, uh, they didn't just take pre-existing statistics because in many cases those statistics did not exist. exist. Right, they actually so, had to do their own yes. investigation to come up with the statistics in the book. So my hat is off to them for that that mm -hmm. incredible understanding. This is, it is the product of hard scholarly work, and mm -hmm. that that sets up the question that I want to I want to ask. There's one we talked about the incident in Cologne and you say the Europeans have been putting their heads in the sand. They've been in denial. They're refusing to see what's taking place. But there's an incident you describe. It's just one of many, but it struck me as telling because it's not just denial. It's something different from that. You tell the story, this is in France, young Bangladeshi who sentenced for raping a 15 year old girl in Normandy was suspended. The criminal is allowed to walk. And you quote a legal expert whom you interviewed about this. He was permitted to walk because, said the legal expert, he had been, quote, deeply influenced by the culture of his country <laughs> where women are relegated to the status of sexual objects. Okay, close quote. <laughs> but that's not turning away. Yeah. That is incorporating <laughs> alien values into French, into the French legal system. Is it not? This is this is this is not turning away. This is beginning to make adjustments, beginning to make concessions. Is that not so? It's like shifting sand. So you run into uh, again. I want to hear what you said. You know, no existing statistics. You ask um, the agencies whose responsibility it is to keep up with this research. Why is there no existing statistic? And they say we don't do that. You say, we think that there is a spike in sexual violence against women. They, that may have to do with immigration and immigrants. That is forcefully denied. And we are told, no, sexual violence has always been there. It's universal. All men do it. So you get that type of argument. In these case by case incidents that take place, the lawyers who defend the perpetrates, the perpetrators will obviously use anything and everything they can get. And if they can get a more lenient sentence or an acquittal for a perpetrator by bringing in culture into it, they do that and it works. And I have seen, uh, and, and the reason, Valerie, thank you for, for your very, very kind words. But the reason why I didn't accept story of, you know, we just don't have the statistics or it doesn't happen or it's because I lived in Europe. I lived in the Netherlands for 14 years and I became familiar 
with all the tactics of denial, of evasion, of not wanting to know, or if the problems become overwhelming, of simply dumping it on the working class groups, rural areas, and just, you know, dismissing these people as racist, xenophobes, whatever, what have you, never ever coming to the point of actually addressing these issues. And I think ultimately that is, that's what uh, I hope to achieve with the book uh, is to have a serious conversation about what is going on and how long this is sustainable. I'd like to point out that one of the most horrifying aspects of the whole Cologne uh, situation that sticks in every woman's mind is what the reaction of the authorities was. The authorities said to the women, it's clear you can't come into these public spaces like you have in the past. Yes. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll set aside a special section for you that will have some increased policing, but maybe you ought to think about whether you should come to these kinds of things at all, which was just horrifying, I think, for every European woman and every woman everywhere to hear, is that the burden and the cost of these kinds of crimes would be placed squarely on the women themselves they would be told to vacate problematic spaces. They would be told they would need to segregate. Um, that, I think, is what most women were left with, a very bad taste. I think the, uh, I think the, the, expression, the, the expression used by the Cologne authorities was that the women should have known to keep these men at arm's length was was with the... The, 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 the oldest and most outrageous response possible. You asked for it, yeah. right? Essentially. Yeah. So, so, so I think that's what you were alluding to. And in fact, yes, that is uh, so part of the subtitle is that there is an erosion of the rights of women. And that uh, is manifests itself in uh, what the authorities were saying to the women, you know, you had to keep these men at arm's length. Why did you go to this context? So many concerts have been cancelled. I think there was one big concert in Sweden that was cancelled and it, it had nothing to do with the pandemic. This is in two 19. But what is even more tragic is what individual women are doing. Some of the women I interviewed said that they didn't need the authorities to tell them to adjust their behavior. They do it anyway, because they can't deal with every day. There's the girl who is taking, she's a young woman who's taking her toddler to daycare before she goes to work. And she tells me what goes through her mind before she leaves her front door. The groups of men on the sidewalk who start hissing and sissing and making these and she tries to put ear pods so as not you know to drown out that kind of obscene noise but then they come and they touch her and they grope her and she feels so unsafe and filthy from her house to the daycare center to her work and back and this is an everyday thing and some of these women have decided they don't want to live that way so it's not some kind of you know top down uh you know don't you have to adjust you women are doing it anyway and and they're they're themselves from the public space. Women are no longer going out to jog. They're not going out to swim. They're not going out to uh, the pub. They're not going out to socialize the way they used to. And many of them and their families have moved to other parts of, you know, those who could afford to. But I think in ultimately for the working class women, we are in many neighborhoods in different European settings where women can't move. They, they, there's nowhere to go. Mm -hmm have already uh, adjusted. Ayan talked about the Netherlands. Valerie talked about the incident in Cologne in Germany. Chris has written a long piece on France. From Chris, Chris writes in the Wall Street Journal that Emmanuel Macron has resolved to be the president who finally eases tensions over France's young and growing Muslim population. And as Chris well knows, there are a lot of people, Douglas Murray wrote that Macron deserves everyone's admiration for giving this a try. That's the European leader who has opened his eyes and is making an effort. How is the effort going? Here's Chris once again. When French leaders sing the praises of an Islam of the Enlightenment, one wonders whether this is a realistic prospect or a figment of their ideological imaginations. Muslims themselves may prefer the real Islam they have studied and loved over the Islam of Republican values that Mr. Macron is proposing, close quote. So even the French effort, the best effort taking place in Europe is not going well. 
Am I, Chris? Is am I overreading your your analysis? No, I don't. I I, I don't think you are. I I, I think, um, you know, of late, um, Macron has tried to take a kind of a strong line on migration, and I think the the reason for that is. Um, the polls that he has seen about, you know, there's a pre presidential election in France next year. And um, Marine Le Pen, who the, you know, the, the, the populist, the, the candidate of the populist right, is polling pretty much neck and neck with Macron, which is sort of a surprise. Um, uh, so of late, Macron has been speaking in a very, uh, in, in, in a very hard line, in a hard line way. In general, this has been the, 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 the attitude you describe has been the European one. To assume that, that Islam is going to naturally sort of fold itself into a, let's say, let's say a, 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 an enlightenment model, um, the way European Christianities did. Now there's a lot of problems with that in the European context. First of all, it really appeared that Christianity was going in that direction for about a half a for about a half a century after the French Revolution. It was a period of of, of very low religious belief. And actually um, Tocqueville um, writes about this in his um, his book on the on on, on the revolution. Um, but suddenly it turned around and suddenly you had a robust uh, European Christianity. So I, I think that that even a lot the of analogy the, is weak. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so even in the most favorable circumstances, that is, the people most inclined to accept the French Enlightenment disposition pull back from it and return to religion. So I don't think there's any reason to assume that Muslims will be less inclined to do that. And by the way. I don't think that that's an unnatural or a, or, or or a negative thing to do to want to pull back from a from a purely rationalistic view of society to a more religion centered or god centered view of society. I don't think there's anything negative about that per se. Well, can, but it's going to make but in the context of a very foreign religion and a religion that has been at odds with the European way of life for about a millennium or a millennium and a half, such an anchoring in religion is bound to create conflicts. So the notion, I haven't studied this obviously the way all three of you have, but I feel it that the note, the Europeans said, look, 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 yes, it's very bad right now, but just wait. Mm -hmm. We Europeans lead such a wonderfully attractive, enjoyable, comfortable life. It can't be more than a generation before these recent immigrants come to mm -hmm. and start to live the way we live. Of course they will. We're just such attractive people. Our life is so attractive. And Chris is saying that is just untenable. It's, that it's is, untenable. So it Ion's is. book uh, musters evidence to show that at least concerning attitudes towards women, that is not correct. She shows that uh, in, in a sense there's been uh, a, a push to have a first generation in every generation, and that mm -hmm. the children of that first wave of immigrants do not show more enlightened attitudes towards women than their parents. This should trouble, I think, all of us. Uh, perhaps they are willing to adopt capitalism, and perhaps they're willing to adopt uh, male Western dress and so forth. But when it comes to women, Women are the ones, in a sense, who will keep the identity going. They are the, the reproducers, not simply in a biological sense, but in a social sense. So they must be very tightly controlled. Uh, what came into my inbox this morning was the tragic story of a young woman in Italy, a daughter of first uh, generation Pakistani immigrants. She refused to marry her cousin back in Pakistan and so the family killed her and buried her and they're looking for her body as we speak so the reproduction if you will of the suppression and subordination of women uh will continue Valerie, let me let me try the the french what the french are attempting is big complicated they're trying to get islamic groups to register and to be licensed up fine 
Ayan says that one reform that they need is immigration reform in mm -hmm. which they pay closer attention to the values of immigrants they permit in. And I see the work of Valerie Hudson and I say to myself, wait a minute, Valerie may be onto something that's a lot simpler and more effective. Let me quote you. This is, this is Valerie, this is you in Politico not long ago. As many governments debate how many migrants to accept, they would be wise to take gender balance into consideration. Years of research have shown that male dominated societies are more susceptible to violence and mistreatment of women, close quote. Well, wait a minute. The European governments need only say, that's it, moratorium on male immigrants until we get some balance here. Or at least they can say from this point forward, we're only going to permit balanced mm -hmm. immigration, gender balanced immigration. And that's all they need to do, Valerie. Well, Canada has that precise approach, but they have the luxury of having the entire Atlantic Ocean separate them from the countries from which these migrants are coming. Yeah. Uh, Europe doesn't have quite that same luxury, but you're right. Canada has said, we will accept no unaccompanied young adult males, none whatsoever. If they're not coming with a family group, they're not coming to Canada, unless they're identified as, as targets of some sort of special uh, discrimination, such as being homosexual or things of that nature. I think the problem is the geographical problem, which is these young men are going to come no matter what. Now, uh, uh, you haven't pointed out Denmark, right, which is now saying, <laughs> uh, we're going to, if you come uh, to Denmark, we're going to ship you to another country outside Europe uh, from which you can apply. Um, you haven't mentioned Hungary, which has said, we're not accepting any at all. You know, so I, I think there's some interesting, there's an interesting diversity of approaches to, you know, what, what do you do? But I think Ion has pointed out in her book, one of the most important things is language and values assimilation as well as workforce participation. Um, I spent a sabbatical in Australia and I was delighted to discover that on the uh, test for Australian citizenship are questions such as, it, is it legal under Australian uh, law to beat your wife? Is it legal under Australian law to arrange a marriage for your daughter? Is it legal under Australian law uh, to circumcise your daughter. Um, and of course, the critics said, well, they all know what the correct answer is to the question, right? They'll just answer it insincerely. But that's not the point. The point is, is they're being made aware that unless they are willing to uh, subscribe to these more enlightened understandings of male-female relations, that they're out of step with Australian societies. And it also tells women that they have those rights under Australian law. So I think Ayan is on the right path when she talks about assimilation in terms of, of, of value assimilation, as well as language assimilation, as well as participation in the workforce. Let me, and only another couple of questions before we go to questions from our viewers here, but let me anticipate the afterword to the paperback edition of Ayan's book, Prey, by coming to another piece by Chris Caldwell. This is in National Review. It's a staggering thing, but let me just read it here. Africa is adding people at a rate never before seen on any continent. The population of Sub-Saharan Africa alone, now about a billion people will more than double to 2.2 billion by mid-century, while that of Western Europe will fall to a doddering half billion or so. Uh, Chris continues to note that by 2050, these are all UN statistics, I think, Chris. You, you're not plucking yes. these out of any- No, no, these, this is these the UN, right. yes, right. yes. By 2050, Nigeria alone will have a population of over 400 million. So if present populations and proportions in Nigeria hold, mm -hmm. that's 200 million, 200 million Muslims. Nigeria is about half and half. So the immigration to Europe of the last five to 10 years that has produced this round of violence, that has produced this denial is as nothing to what is coming. Is that correct, Chris? I think that's right, yes. I mean, when you talk about a, um, you talk about a billion people um, in, a, in a not particularly productive 
part of the world, you know, that is, it's hard, it's harder to feed a person in Africa than it is um, uh, elsewhere. Um, when you add children at a great rate, you tend to, I mean, it, it can be a great boon for a society, but that tends to come further down the line. I mean, the effort of bringing up dependence usually puts further strain on, on societies. And um, the, the, the major development in, in Europe over the last 10 years has been the, the sort of removal of the government in Libya to turn Libya into a fairly lawless area. So basically there's no longer a wall between Africa and Europe. There's basically a set of, um, you know, smuggling businesses who operate out of out of Tripoli and are kept in check sometimes and allowed to operate sometimes by the by the authorities there, um, uh, who are depending on which part of Libya you're in under Turkish or or Russian influence, um, and so you have a you have a pretty wide open Mediterranean now. Now an interesting element to this that 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 I have not yet looked into is how much of this migration that's coming from sub-Saharan Africa is, is of Muslims and how much is of Christians, because the countries that they draw from tend to have a large number of both. Mm -hmm. um, I've never, I have not seen, I have not seen work on that and maybe, maybe I on, you know, would know. Anyway, that I think is this, that is the sort of, that is the, 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 the raw material of the transformation of Europe for the next let's say, generation or so. So, Ayan, if they're in denial now, what, 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 what happens to Europe? Well, or do you get, Valerie mentioned, there are, there are experiments, so to speak, taking place. Mm -hmm. Denmark is saying, come to us, we'll ship you out of the country right away. Hungary is saying, we're going to control our own borders, thank you very much. Is, is, uh, I don't quite know. I don't know what they should do, honestly. Yeah. In, well, in anticipation of, so, so what do you make of all this? So there are different scenarios possible. And uh, you could say, you could take best case type of scenarios where you would say, okay, all of these European countries get together on an EU level and they adopt Austrian niche and maybe Hungarian, the Hungarian approaches, which is to embark on a path of developing very sensible, practical immigration policies, go back to the idea of borders. It's almost a blasphemy now in some of these countries to use the word borders um, or to use the, word, the phrase nation state and national identity. So they could, there's that scenario where they do that embark on then a program of value assimilation as Valerie described precisely. But there's also a scenario where that doesn't happen. I think France is in a very tense place right now. You had a number of ex-generals in their military uh, write an open letter where they're alluding to a civil war. And many of the French intellectuals, I think Christopher, you know some of them mm -hmm. better than I do, for a long time have been warning against this type uh, I've been speaking to journalists in Sweden today and yesterday, and they, they say that there is um, a sense of hopelessness, but also a deep sense of anger in Sweden. People in Sweden are clenching their fists and expressing themselves in ways that their leadership is not channeling into good things. So in this type of clenched fist uh, scenarios, I, I think the scenario that that can lead to is we saw in the Balkans in the 1990s, where you have a meltdown of institutions, and then these countries break into factions, and uh, then we're, we're really talking about a very dreadful, dreadful case. Now, I want to add one more point where Christopher left off and said, you know, Africa and Islam. Look, the continent of Africa is large, and I think that very little attention is now paid to the spread of radical Islam. Uh, you know, ISIS was 
uh, this, I don't want to say destroyed, but I mean, uh, the, the grip on the territories in Syria and Iraq, that was taken away from them. But their ideology, their organization, their fundraising, uh, all of that has now moved to very frail fra and fragile states in Africa. And so if you say, uh, you know, can you look into the next, what will the next two decades for Africa, it's going to bring an Islamization in Africa and of the radical sort. And that is also going to bring to pushing more people out uh, who may come through the Mediterranean and other routes. There are four routes in total, but uh, the, uh, what is without a doubt is the number of Muslims who will come from Africa, the Middle East and South Asia and come into Europe. That be huge. And yes, the, the European leadership is not prepared for it. Last last question, and this is for each of you, and I'm going to indulge myself a little bit by taking a moment or two to set it up. I'll use three quotations. Ayan Hirsi Ali and pray, if European leaders continue to stick their heads in the sand, then I believe that within a decade or two, there will be a meaningful rollback of women's rights. Here's quotation number two, Valerie Hudson. What you do to your women, you do to your nation state. If you decide to curse your women, you will curse your nation state as well. That's right. So Ayan argues in the first quotation that the rights of European women are in danger. And Valerie argues that means that European nations themselves are in danger. Now here's the third quotation, Christopher Caldwell. Since the turn of the century, Europeans have been faced with the most basic question about their future whether they have one last question do they valerie oh that's a wonderful question that i ask myself even though i'm an american um and um I, ion points out in her book that what western women have achieved not only in terms of of civil and legal rights but economic rights marriage rights rights to personal safety, norms that sexual violence is wrong, even within the household. Do you realize that I am sure the percentage of women who have ever had that package of rights, uh, even on the planet right now, is very small? And if we look at the history of humankind, must be the tiniest, tiniest fraction of women who have ever lived. If Europe is willing to jettison that incredible, absolutely revolutionary legacy, uh, then I, I am gobsmacked as to what they think their future will be, because it will not be a good one. Chris? Very good, yeah. I think we're in a, I, I think Europe is in a very complicated position. I don't think it has a, a clear um, path forward that is i think i think valerie looking at this problem sees a right choice and a wrong choice i think that the problem is that that that, that europe is the, the 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 problem is that, that that europe has become sort of relativistic okay we talked about that court case in 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 France, where you said, I, I believe you said, you know, France is now importing foreign values as French. You know, well, you know, it has signed up to the project of the of the European Union. It now has agreed to a process under which Fr French law is subordinate to law decided, you know, in Brussels and under the influence of the French economy and of the German economy. Excuse me. And once you decide to do that, you'll say, you know, it's an easy enough thing to say to the French, average French citizen, okay, so you, you're going to take a certain amount of dictation from people in Bulgaria. Why will you take dictation from people in Bulgaria and not the considerably more sophisticated civilization of Turkey? You know what I mean? Why? What's so special about, you know, if you're going to allow your institutions to be subordinated to those of, I don't know, name a macho Mediterranean country, you know, in, 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 in Europe, why not sort of like take things in stride when it comes to sort of certain 
comportments that strike you as North African. Chris, Chris can I, I'm sorry, Ayan, we give you the closing word in just yeah. a moment. I, 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 can't, I see Chris so seldom that I can't resist. I, yeah. Is Germany a special problem here in as much as A, whether they want to or not, and they seem not to want to, they dominate the European Union, and B, the war guilt just doesn't seem to go away. In well, some basic way, they want, they wish their own dissolution as a nation. Well, you could say that the United States has sort of developed that type of ideology itself in the last five or 10 years. So I don't think that that, that Germany is outside of the range of what we They're see not. here. I think Germany, I think Germany has some special problems. I think they're too complicated to go into in this context. I mean, I would say that that for historical reasons, they've been deprived of sovereignty, a certain amount of sovereignty and a certain amount of self-rule. And so they tend to favor a system in Europe that limits sovereignty and self-rule for others, which I think leaves other countries with less with fewer financial resources at their disposal without the ability that Germany has to deal with these problems. But I think that's a different, I think that's a slightly as, off of our as to the problem. As to the problem we're discussing right now, Germany's not a special, it's, it, it, it's just another know. European, all right, thank it's you. It's got interesting particularities. I mean, it's got, I mean, it, it, the, the Turkish minority is very interesting, very successful in many ways. I, I mean, economically in terms of cultural achievements, um, very unsuccessful in terms of assimilation. It's a, it's just, it's its own thing, Germany. It's its own thing. Yeah. Ayan, the future of Europe. So there are different futures that are possible. There is the bleak one that we've all just talked about. Um, there is, I have to say, there are obviously thousands of Muslims in Europe who are uh, fully assimilated. Uh, but because they're assimilated into European norms and values, they can't fulfill the fantasy Kron has and other European leaders that uh, that equals to a European Islam. There is just no European Islam. The people who are pushing Islam as a set of norms, values, civilization, those are the Islamists. The ones who are assimilated are not doing that. There might be a good scenario where uh, we were talking about women, working class women, the working class women of Europe, and the assimilated immigrant women who are seeking more from their families and so on, they form some form of a coalition and blow life into the dying embers of feminism in Europe. That's possible. Uh, and I, it's something that I would encourage wholeheartedly. In fact, during the process while I was writing this book, the people who are most honest, most forthcoming were the assimilated immigrant individuals or their children, whether they are men or women, or who, who gave me, I would say, the most heartening idea of what Europe would look but what they are pushing forward is not uh, a new Islam or a Euro Islam or any of that nonsense. It is basically a return to the uh, traditions and the legacy of the Enlightenment and everything that they found in Europe and that is wonderful about Europe. Um, and then the, the scenarios that we have all discussed, the negative ones right now prevail in, in, in my head, but then I, you know, you process like Brexit. Um, you look at, again, what Macron is doing in France, uh, what's going on in Denmark, you tie all of these things together. And there might be an opportunity for a renaissance. Uh, who knows? Uh, but I wholeheartedly agree with, with what Valerie is saying, that if they carry on allowing their women uh, to be, uh, European women to be subjected to a place where they have to live with the honor code and the word modesty is now gaining in currency, then I think it's finished. Mm. Ayan Hirsi Ali, Christopher Caldwell and Valerie Hudson, thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution and Fox Nation, I'm